Well, good evening, good evening. Welcome once again to the Savior's Cross broadcast. Uh, we are coming to you uh, live from the sanctuary uh, of West Franklin Baptist Church here in Gastonia, North Carolina. Uh, we are at 450 South Myrtle School Road um, here in Gastonia, just right off of Franklin uh, Boulevard. Uh, we'll go ahead and give a plug for our church. If you do not have a home church, uh, be glad to have you, have you to come and, and visit with us and worship with us. Uh, we preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified here. Uh, that is the main message here at West Franklin. As a matter of fact, uh, I believe it is the message for the world today. Uh, so if you don't have a home church, uh, not attending somewhere, maybe the Lord has been laying it on your heart uh, since the COVID restrictions have been lifted. Uh, just come uh, give us a try, and uh, I am sure that you will feel welcome. Uh, also, uh, please uh, like and share the Savior's Cross broadcast uh, if you uh, so choose to do, um, and maybe share it with some of your friends. Uh, also, uh, the Savior's Cross uh, ministry and the broadcast, um, we upload all of the um, videos to our Savior's Cross YouTube channel. Uh, and we've been studying uh, the tabernacle, um, the great, great tabernacle of the Old Testament uh, for several, several weeks now. And if you've never <clears throat> had an opportunity to do your own personal study uh, of the tabernacles, you can certainly go back into the archives and uh, maybe something that... Uh, uh, one of uh, the brethren has said will bring something to your light to, that'll help you understand the great, great work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, so I want to wel also welcome um, my brother in Christ, uh, preacher Jamie Ellis. Uh, it's so good to have you uh, tonight, brother. Uh, how are you doing? And uh, tell the folks a little bit about what's going on. I'm doing uh, fairly well. I'm glad to be here. Uh enjoying this study on the tabernacle immensely. I, the Lord is really doing, I think, great things with it. And I trust that those of you who watch us uh, regularly <coughs> are learning and uh, as we are learning ourselves. Uh, this is an ongoing process. We, we're students. Uh, That's we're right. learning what God has put in His Word for <coughs> us to, to understand uh, uh, more about Christ and uh, how the, the Old Testament is so pertinent for the understanding of the New Testament right. concerning the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you to, when you read the Word of God, look for Christ, especially in the Old Testament. Look for Him. You can find Him uh, in all the pages of the Bible. Yes, uh, He is the subject of the Bible. What He did on the cross... His finished work is the most important subject of all. And uh, as was so <coughs> grand, grandly uh, displayed and prophesied by Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 53. Yes. But, uh, when you look at this tabernacle, <coughs> every time we go into a certain aspect of the study, we are actually seeing the person of Christ typified. And tonight, as we actually are going in, we're actually tonight going into the tabernacle itself. Amen. Uh, coming from the outer court into the inner and uh, going to the showbread. I, I'm excited, preacher, about looking at the showbread tonight and uh, very thankful for it. Now, uh, with all that <coughs> being said, I, I, I just want to say I'm thankful for the prayers of the, the church, uh, just to say a, a little bit about myself. And ask you to be praying for me. I go tomorrow uh, for some tests. And the Lord knows all about it. And uh, I, I appreciate your prayers. And uh, God knows where we are. But tonight, let's redirect our thoughts back to the, to the tabernacle. And let's see what the Lord has for us. Amen. Praise the Lord. As uh, Preacher Ellis has, has said, we are now uh, about to enter into... Um, the actual tabernacle itself. Uh, we spent uh, a good amount of time with the construction uh, of the outer court. 
uh, the fence or, or the gate, uh, looking at the great brazen altar, and then uh, the great brazen labor. Uh, but now we're entering into uh, the tabernacle uh, itself, uh, mm -hmm. that which is called uh, the most holy place. Uh, uh, Brother Ellis, I, I, I think about the wonder uh, that those priests must, must have, uh, or the awe that they must have experienced as they would go in to the first, um, I guess you would say the first, <clears throat> maybe the first room, if you will, of the tabernacle, and, and as they would go in, uh, they would uh, see uh, three uh, pieces of furniture, uh, as we would uh, describe it, as, as they would go in. Um, first, uh, they would see against, uh, straight ahead, uh, they would see the uh, altar uh, of incense, that there was a veil that separated that from the Holy of Holies, so... Uh, they would see this altar of incense, and then to the left, as they would go in, uh, they would see uh, the, the, the golden lampstand uh, that we'll be looking at a little bit later. But the subject for tonight, as they would walk in to the right, uh, there was a, uh, an item or a piece of furniture that is described uh, in God's Word as the table uh, of presence or the table of showbread. Uh, and we want to look at that tonight um, and see <clears throat> our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and His great work and His great provision for us uh, in this. And we want to look at this magnificent type. Um, and as Brother Ellis has said, I want to mention that before we go uh, into the Scripture uh, once again, to, to reiterate it, um, is <clears throat> the more you see Christ, the more that I can see Him. Yes. And God has provided, um, I, I know that maybe there's some uh, beginning, maybe there's some beginning Bible students out there. And uh, the, the Old Testament, uh, God so graciously recorded all of these things in the Old Testament uh, not only from a history perspective, but also to give us a type and a shadow uh, of things that would come, namely the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, again, uh, Brother Ellis said it very, very well. Uh, you can find the Lord Jesus Christ virtually all the way through the Old Testament. And the reason, the reason that I'm taking time to repeat this is, <clears throat> again, the more you see Christ, the more that Christ can be revealed, not just in his humanity, but in his, in his servanthood, in his yes. priestly work, uh, in everything that he himself um, as the God-man has provided for us is tremendously uh, helpful indeed to our Christian walk because the more, the more I can see Christ and the more I can see what he's done, the more that I can see his fit, what his finished work entailed, and the more I can see the largeness and the scope of who Jesus is and what he did, uh, it is a great, great faith builder for me. Yes. And uh, it helps me along my way. So um, we'll go ahead <clears throat> and we'll be reading tonight uh, in Exodus chapter number 25. Uh, if you want to take your Bibles, we'll go there. Exodus chapter 25, uh, starting at verse number 23. And we are using tonight as an aid uh, and a reference uh, the Expositor's Study Bible. Uh, and uh, we're going to uh, ask Brother Ellis to start at verse number 23. He'll be reading the text, uh, and we'll read the notes, and we'll just see what the Lord would bring to light for us tonight. You shall also make a table of shittim wood. Once again, this indestructible wood, a perfect type of the perfection of the humanity of Christ. Two cubits shall be the length thereof. Three feet. And, three, and a cubit the breadth thereof. One and a half feet. And a cubit and a half the height thereof. Two and one quarter feet. This is showing the dimensions, 
of the table of showbread. And you shall overlay it with pure gold. Typical of the deity of Christ. And make thereto a crown of gold round about. Christ is the king. And you shall make it un make unto it a border and hand breadth round about. It is interesting that the width of the crown is described as a hand breadth, which is approximately three to four inches high. This corresponds with the words of Christ, neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. John chapter 10, verse 28. And you shall make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. The table was to hold bread, which again was a type of Christ. The crown would tend to keep the bread in place so that it would not slip off the table, especially during the times when Israel was instructed by the Lord to move. This speaks of the security of the believer, which is all in Christ. And you shall make for it four rings of gold <clears throat> and put the rings in the four corners that are on the four feet thereof, over against the border shall the rings be for, be for places of the staves to bear the table, and you shall make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold, and the table, and that the table, may be born with them. I like this note here, Brother Ellis. Wherever yes. the Lord led Israel, even though it was in the wilderness, his table accompanied them. So wherever Christian's lot may be cast, even though it may be a prison, <laughs> such as in the case of Paul, the believer can continue to feed on Christ, for Christ is ever with him. Yes, and you shall make the dishes thereof, the spoons thereof, the, and coverings thereof, and bowls thereof, to cover with all of pure gold shall you make them. The dishes were no doubt used by the priest when they ate the bread on the seventh day. The spoons and the cover were more than likely used in connection with the frankincense, which was to be poured over the bread, symbolizing the fragrance and purity mm. of Christ. The bowls were probably cups and were used in connection with the drink offerings, which were poured out before the Lord in the holy place, Numbers 28 and 7. And you shall set upon the table showbread before me always. This was a type of Christ as the bread of life, John chapter 6, verse 58. Christ is always before the Father making intercession. Uh, Brother Ellis, before we move to uh, Leviticus uh, to start describing the bread. Um, this let's let's take the folks uh, and 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 bring bring it into view if we can. Um, what this table, this actual table, and the bread represented. Well, it it represented. Uh... <clears throat> the uh, everlastingness of Christ, if you want to say it that way, the eternality of Christ. It represented his divinity and um, his indestructibleness, that death could not hold him, the grave could not hold him. The table itself is, re is actually, as it said, made of shittim wood, like the Ark of the Covenant as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, and, and even to go back to the brazen altar, uh, this wood is typified of, of that of being that of indestructible. And so it, it really typifies the fact that uh, it, the work of God itself is an everlasting and eternal work. This is something that God does. Uh, and this, actually the table of showbread itself, it also represents uh, the royalty. You see the top part of the, of the table, the crown, the crown of gold, how that the crown itself um, uh, represents the divinity, if you will, of Christ, his deity. And, um, and also uh, with it being a hand, I like how he talked about it being a hand breadth, um, how that there was a, a rise there 
uh, that down inside, that down inside, mm -hmm. uh, there would be, uh, not like it's actually shown right, right there, but down inside, uh, the crown would be around the top and that would represent <coughs> um, the security or, you know, as they moved from place to place by the staves, you know, being placed through the rings. Uh, whenever God said move, they had to move. And if the showbread were there, they had to go. And so whatever God did, and whatever Absolutely. God said, we had to be obedient. They had to be obedient to what the Lord said do. And uh, so there's, a, there's much represented here um, concerning what the table represents. But the one thing that sticks out to me uh, the most about the table of showbread is how that Christ is our sustenance. Absolutely. Is that it typifies that uh, one in Christ shall never hunger. Even as Jesus told the woman at the well, if you drink of this water, right. you shall never thirst again. Amen. And Jesus said, if you, if you eat of my flesh, you shall never hunger. Amen. And uh, which really uh, speaks of his death, our being participants uh, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We're being placed into Christ. Once we're in him and he's in us, the, the, that, that inner hunger, that emptiness that you had prior to salvation, that void <clears throat> is thus, it has been filled and that hunger is, is not really that hunger anymore. It's, it, it, if you want to say it this way, in, instead of being changed, it's exchanged. In other words, your life is not your life anymore, but Christ has become your life. And now your hunger is for the bread of life and for the milk, even as Peter said, as newborn babes mm -hmm. desire. Once you get bo born into the family of God, you desire the sincere milk of the word. But, and then you go on to eat the bread. Jesus is the bread of life. And to me, like I said, the, the greatest part of it uh, speaks of our uh, never hungering, Never thirsting Amen. Uh, uh, again because you've got the, the cups there as well. Amen. Uh, the drink offering, so to speak. We will never hunger. We will never thirst again in Christ. Brother Ellis, uh, just for simplicity's sake, uh, my mind's taken back um, to John chapter 6 where Jesus uh, had fed the 5,000. Yeah. And uh, the, some of the folks uh, had had began to, to listen to Jesus teach after the feeding. And uh, Jesus uh, made some statements about eating his body. Uh -huh. And uh, they were perplexed That's right. uh, uh, at those words. They didn't fully comprehend what he was saying. As a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, I believe they said, how, how can this be? That's right. Um, and, and as you were speaking, uh, it made me think, you know, there is... Uh, of physical bread, but what we must realize is that humanity, yes, we have a need for physical sustenance. Yes, we have a need for uh, physical food, and we have we have uh, a great need for food that is good for us. That's right. In a physical sense, but Christ is our representative here as being our spiritual food. And there is a great spiritual hunger uh, that is in the world today. Many, many do not really realize what they're missing. Uh, that there's, a, there's a hunger that goes beyond just the physical being hungry, the, 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 the hunger that, that involves the stomach as, as we know it, or the appetite and uh, as we know it in the physical, but there is a, there is a hunger uh, in the heart and soul of man, That's Brother right. Ellis, um, that this table represents, and as we move forward, it, it'll, it'll bring it out more and more. Um, but Brother Ellis, there's, um, there's a hunger that man has 
that cannot be filled or satisfied by anything other than Christ who is who this bread is representing. Absolutely. The the world is seeking all kinds of outlets. Uh, people tonight, this evening, are seeking all kinds of outlets for satisfaction of spirit and soul, and the world does not produce it. It's not out there. That's right. No matter where you go, no matter what source you, you go to, uh, whatever you try to seek after, uh, we, we can say this, as we've said it many times on our program, uh, drugs doesn't do it, um, the strong drink doesn't do it, uh, the, the world itself, the things that the world, ought, there's no satisfaction uh, to, the, to the spirit and soul of man given, to, given from the world that will bring that satisfaction. But Christ, Christ is, he is the one who brings the satisfaction because what we lost in Adam put us in a death, death situation. We yes. were born dead in our spirit. We needed life in our spirit. That's what the need uh, tonight is for man to partake of the living bread, to partake of, as Jesus declared it in John chapter 6, he said, I am the bread of life. Yes. And I am that living bread. Yes. And when we partake of that living bread, that satisfaction is, is, is fulfilled. Uh, no one has ever been able, and I want to speak on a personal level here, I've never been satisfied with anything else but Jesus. Amen. I'll never be, I, and I know this, because th I'll never ever be satisfied with anything else but Jesus because uh, there's nothing greater than him in, in our lives and he's the greatest if you're saved tonight you will agree with me that he is the single most greatest thing that's ever happened to you that's ever come into your life and so tonight as we look at this and we've got aspects and several things to look at in this showbread I want to encourage you to to see Christ uh, in this, in, in the tabernacle here at, as we stand in front of this table of showbread and, and look at it and just uh, observe what God typified in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, that he might bring in the New Covenant. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, if that's all we have in this section, we'll, we'll turn our attention to Leviticus chapter number 24 uh, and we, we can as we turn to Leviticus chapter number 24 starting at verse 5 uh, we're going to see a little bit more detail mm -hmm. uh, concerning uh, the showbread itself uh, in Exodus it, it described uh, the table itself the construction um, the acacia wood uh, covered in gold and uh, the the kingly uh, look and the deity. Well, we want to take a, a little bit of a closer look uh, at the showbread itself, uh, starting at verse number five. And you shall take fine flour, a type of the perfect life of Christ, and bake twelve cakes thereof. Twelve is God's number for government. How, however, we must always remember that it's the government of God as outlined in God's word, not the government of man. This has always been the greatest hindrance to the work of God. Men attempt to change the government of God by instituting man-devised government and claiming it to be of God. Two-tenth deals shall be in one cake. The cake represents Christ and refers to the fact that government is strictly of him. Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. And you shall set them in two rows, six on a row. All of this, this bread representing Christ. Upon the pure table before the Lord. This pure table was covered with pure gold that stood before the Lord, pure frankincense, 
was to be burned upon the pure table, this signifies that all things connected with Jehovah and his worship were to be pure, thus typifying the purity of life and conduct of the worshipers who come before him. And you shall put pure frankincense, a bitter substance, upon each row. There were two stacks of cakes or bread, six to the stack, with a container of frankincense on top of each stack, continually burning. That it may be on the bread for a memorial. The memory of Christ must be kept alive constantly, which by and large pertains to what he did for us at the cross. Even an offering made by fire unto the Lord. The burning of the frankincense at the top of the stacks made the showbread an offering made by fire unto Jehovah. Actually, the loaves were not burned in the fire, for they were to be eaten by the priest in the holy place as the most holy of the offerings. The fire represented judgment, whether the burning out of dross in the lives of believers, Matthew 3.11, or judgment for sin, Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. Every, every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually. Every Sabbath all twelve loaves of the bread were to be eaten by the priest. With new loaves taking their place, it was a type of our partaking of Christ as the bread of life. John six fifty eight, Being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. This pertains to the fact that every Israelite had to give a half shekel of silver each year, which contributed annually toward the maintenance and service in the sanctuary. The securing of ingredients, etc., etc., silver, represented redemption, which is what Christ would bring about as a result of his death on the cross. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons. This refers to the entirety of the priesthood, which were to be in the lineage of Aaron. And they shall eat it. Each Sabbath. In the holy place. The first room of the tabernacle. For it is most holy. Because it typified Christ in his perfection, with that perfection given to believers, typified by the bread being eaten by the priests. Unto him of the offerings of the Lord made by fire, by a perpetual statute. All of this was fulfilled in Christ. But it continues to be perpetual in that believers are to partake of Christ constantly. He is our rest, typified by the Sabbath. Yes, amen. Amen. Brother Ellis, going back to uh, verse number 5, uh, is speaking of it, the, the scripture says, and, and again seeing Christ in type and shadow, it says, Thou shalt take fine flour. And bake twelve cakes thereof. Two tenth deals shall be in one cake. The fine flour, one of the things in my studies. And everything, Brother Ellis, representing Christ. Christ in his work. And Christ in his person was perfect. And still is perfect. And thus the fine flour. Uh, from what I understand, this, this bread, it was just not something that was thrown together. It went through a, uh, this fine flour went through a sifting process. Oh, yeah. It went through a great sifting process to, to pull out anything that was coarse, thus making it uh, the finest uh, flour that could be used uh, during that time. And this so represents the perfection of our Lord. Yes, it, they, they, <laughs> talking about the sifting, how that they had to make sure that, that nothing, nothing of the world, nothing of, nothing, I mean at all, that uh, any foreign object that would get into the flower, they had to make specific surety that it was as fine as could possibly be and it was as pure as possible, which, all, which again, as you've said, represents the purity, as the, the Scripture teaches here, of the life of Christ. Um, uh, anything else uh, God would not accept. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, <laughs> nothing would uh, satisfy. I mean, 
even in the in in that priesthood, God had His demands. Yes, He demanded perfection uh, right. of such uh, in order that He might be, uh, and I would say it this way, accurately worshipped. Right. How that He, how that these offerings would be brought to Him, and and uh, you know, as as we we've talked about that. You know, there are differences of opinion about this frankincense and, and so on and so forth. But as, as the priest would go over to the altar of incense and, and, and offer that incense and pour it on that, and the incense would go up, oh my. That, there's so much involved in, with uh, uh, the fact, some even believe that the frankincense as we talked about it being a bitter herb, was even sprinkled on the bread. I'm not sure about that. We don't know about that. We do know, as the scripture here says, that the cups themselves were set up on top mm -hmm. of, of each stack of uh, these uh, six uh, particular and perfectly made. <laughs> yes. Let me say it again, perfectly made right. uh, pieces of showbread. And uh, so um, that could also speak of, uh, you know, I think you could tie in, there's no doubt you could tie in the work of the cross there with the, the bitterness of the frankincense. Oh, absolutely. And of the bread. And absolutely. The cross is seen there. I mean, in, in, in everything that we, we're looking at in this tabernacle and uh, coming to this first part into the Holy of Holies, yes. preacher, it... It, it's, it's phenomenal. It's amazing with all the grandeur that these um, uh, priests would go in and see. But what's amazing is that looking back, uh, what they could see then, they couldn't see what we see now. We right. can look back and tip of everything that they did. You, could, you get a picture of the Lamb of God Amen. taken away. Amen. The sin of the world. He took our bitter death. Man. He took our bitter cross. Yes. He took it. And then also going on further, and as we're, we, I mean, we are preaching the cross here and the message of the cross. Amen. Friend, I, I want you to understand that he not only took that death for us, but he loved us so much that he would take the whole of humanity uh, in in death with him. Yes, amen. There is room at the cross amen. for you. Right. There's room at the cross for you. Amen. Jesus died for all. Yes. And in and in taking everybody's dead, there is a place. There was a place for Hitler. There was a place for uh, Napoleon. There was a place for all. Right. Uh, even Judas would have had a place. He could have had a place. We know he was the son of perdition. But God, uh, again, as we talked a little bit earlier, He doesn't tamper with the free will of man. God gives us a choice. Yes. And in giving us that choice, uh, it's very crucial, especially as we look at what Christ has done in our behalf, all that He has done. And, and just going in, and, and I'll stop off with just this part right here, preacher, and we'll move on, but... Just seeing this first part, bringing you to this table of showbread, uh, seeing that the first thing is that He is our life source. Yes, He's our life. And from that, uh, not trying to get ahead, but that illumination comes on that bread, on that life. Uh, God quickens that. Yes. And uh, that, that, how, that, how they worked with this showbread, how they did what they did is, is, is quite amazing. Amen, amen. I don't, I don't know if it would be premature, Brother Ellis, but you and I were talking, uh, Brother Ellis and I were talking before the, the broadcast, uh, how this, this bread was perpetual. That's right. Uh, in other words, um, I believe the Jewish Targum records uh, how this bread was handled, and, and, and I'll condense it, uh, how there would be four priests that would come in uh, and 
two of the priests would, would take those two stacks, two, uh, one a stack of six, another a stack of six, and, and on the, every Sabbath, the, the, that bread would be removed, and just no sooner as that bread was removed, there was two more priests that slid 12 fresh cakes in its place. In other words, um, and we also were talking about the, um, uh, the table of showbread and how the, the showbread, uh, the term showbread um, carries the idea of the, the bread of presence or the bread of face or faces. Uh, but that bread uh, was continually and is now continually in the face of God and in the presence of God and, and not only in the presence of God as, as an approval uh, because that, that bread was made of fine flour. And, and I am sure, I am sure if they had deviated, mm -hmm. if they had deviated from the making of this bread and, and the scripture does not say that it was unleavened but I believe that yeah, it, it yeah, had yeah. to be oh, made yeah. out of out of unleavened bread, which leaven is a type of, of sin in the Bible. Uh, but not only the perpetual, uh, to be a perpetual statute or a perpetual praise to the Father, but it is a perpetual, never-ending source for humanity. In other words, the bread never runs out. And, and, and one of the things, too, and, and I don't want to uh, lead us in a, uh, but I, I think this is, this is true, Brother Ellis. Uh, a lot of times we look at Jesus being the bread of life as, uh, and limiting this bread to our salvation experience, uh, which is great. I'm so glad that when I tasted of this bread and I took I tasted, as the scripture says, of the heavenly gift, and I took this bread to myself uh, in, in faith uh, that it, it affords me eternal life. But, uh, uh, preacher, we can also go back every day. We can go back to this table every day and, and gain this sustenance that, which is Christ for anything that we're lacking in our life. That's right. I, I want to bring out, too, one other thing about the priest when they actually came in to exchange the bread. Uh, two of those priests stood at the north side, right. the north side of the tabernacle, and two on the south side. Mm -hmm. And so that, too, represents the sufficiency, the all-sufficiency of Christ and Him supplying to the believer uh, uh, because, and what I mean by that, there is a starting point and a stopping point from north to south and south to north. But from east to west, there is no stopping point. Right. And, and, and in that, I want to mention that when, when you walk in to the, the outer court and you walk through the gate, uh, that's the eastern gate, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And all the way back to the west part of it, uh, where the, glory to God, where, where the Ark of the Covenant is and the blood is sprinkled, and so far hath he... <laughs> yes. And so far hath he, he removed, removed our sins. Amen. As far as east is from west. Yes. So far hath he removed our sins from us. But Amen. while we're here, preacher, upon earth, yes. that north and south direction of those priests, we have, an, listen, catch this. Now this has to be caught. We have enough sustenance. Jesus is enough. Yes. And those, those four priests representing north and south means that every day of every day, anywhere and everywhere, hallelujah, Jesus Christ is enough. He's enough for me today. He'll be, he was enough for me yesterday. And he'll be enough for me tomorrow while we're here upon earth. And why? Because he has so far removed our sins. Amen. And, and in doing that, oh, hallelujah, that, that whole thing of the sacrifice, these offerings are precious. But the, sacri the offering, 
Oh, glory to God. The offering of offerings is when he walked up Calvary's hill yes. and laid down his life and became uh, the whole thing, the propitiation Man. for our sins. Amen. Praise the and Lord. And not just the propitiation for our sins, but also <laughs> he's the whole thing going back and staying with context tonight. He is the bread of our life. Amen. We can, as the pastor has very ably said, we can, we can every day, God has given us such a wonderful book. This book, the Bible, this bread, this is the living bread. We can partake of it. We can eat, amen, daily and partake of Christ and find him throughout every page. He's not just in the New Testament, friend. Uh, I've heard people make statements, the old Bible. What old Bible? What are you talking about? That's right. No, no, no. Uh, there's just one Bible. Amen. And it's 66 books, 39 in the old, 27 in the new. Amen. And Jesus is on every page. Praise the Lord. And so we can find him everywhere. Amen. Um, Brother Ellis, I, I got to take a moment and bring this out. Um, as I was studying uh, concerning this bread uh, and this table, uh, my mind went back to Mephibosheth. Oh, yeah. My mind, and I, I wrote this, I wrote uh, and copied this in my notes uh, in Second Samuel chapter number 9, starting at verse 6. Uh, the, and, you know, to make a long story short, um, there was a, uh, a young cripple uh, in the Old Testament that was of the house of Saul. And uh, so, uh, as we know, uh, the house of Saul was uh, at enmity uh, against the house of David. And um, <laughs> as the story would go, um, there was a little boy. Uh, after David had taken the kingdom, there was a little boy that had fell during the skirmishes, I guess, of war and became crippled. Now, he was the, of the house of Saul, uh, and they were uh, dire enemies. And back in those days, um, uh, they would destroy everyone, uh, one kingdom against another. In other words, they would leave no one alive, especially in the kingly line, for fear that a new king would raise up in, in, in that line. But anyway, um, there was a... Uh, a very, very special bond uh, between uh, King David and Saul's son, Jonathan. And uh, David made a statement. Uh, he said, is there anyone, mm -hmm. is there anyone of the house of Saul that I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? Jonathan being a type of Christ. And uh, they found Mephibosheth. They found this young cripple. The scripture says, Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And here's the point. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan." thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. And listen, and thou shalt eat bread <laughs> continually Amen, at my table. That's and right. he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant? What is thy servant that thou should look upon? And this was the language back then. What is thy servant that thou should look upon a dead dog such as I? And as I, I began thinking about this table of showbread and it, this represented, representing uh, the presence of God and, um, and, and looking at Mephibosheth, uh, Brother Ellis, this was a king's table. Yes. This, was, this was the king's table. And to dine uh, in Old Testament types, to dine at the king's table was to be, number one, privileged to the best. That's right. To be privileged to the best of the best. And um, I guess that was one of the things that, 
that jumped out at me at this table of showbread. Jesus being the bread of life, uh, if you and I will take him to ourselves, take him and eat, take and eat, taste and see that the Lord is good, well, we'll take and eat this bread by faith. We automatically, we automatically are, are being seated. We're seated uh, at the king's table. Uh, and I, I dare say, Brother Ellis, that there's nothing that this life would throw at us that cannot be satisfied from this table. That's right. Every, every possible thing that happens, every circumstance, every situation that we will go through in this life, uh, the answer is found in, in the cross. It's found in the work of Christ and in the word of Christ. And to be able to stand on the promise, to stand on the promises of God, to stand on this word, um, and to not just stand on it, but to partake of it, uh, to digest. Uh, my prayer is that God will enable us uh, to digest what we read when we read it, yes. to take it into our hearts and that we might be conformed to the image of His dear Son. Amen. That bread is, is what matures us. Uh, it brings us uh, into maturity. And, um, you know, if you go to the book of Hebrews, uh, you go from maturity. You, 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 eat, you eat the bread, and, and then at some point in time, God gives us the meat. Right. We get in on uh, uh, the more meatier things of God. And, and I pr I, my prayer is that uh, every time we open the lids, uh, my wife and I, as we study together uh, and try to partake of Him, uh, that He will reveal Himself to us. The ultimate goal or the ultimate was uh, the manifest presence. You know, going back to this, the showbread, showbread of presence mm -hmm. is what the showbread uh, meant. Or you mentioned, uh, or as we talked about it earlier, the showbread of face or faces or whatever. But uh, face, speaking of one, the presence, that bread being there, as, that, as those priests would exchange that out, Every seven days, uh, they would take it out, put new, fresh in. Glory to God. Continually, yes, continually before the Lord. Uh, this is something that I think that should be brought out right here too, Pastor, is uh, to get into the Word of God is to step into the presence of God. The pre See, God reveals himself primarily through his word. Yes. He wants us to dwell in his presence. When we open this book, the entrance, the psalmist said, of thy light giveth, giveth I mean, the entrance of thy word giveth light. We, we, we begin to see. God opens our eyes and he fills us. If you want the filling of the Holy Spirit, get full of God, get full of Jesus, get full of his word. Feed off of Christ, uh, partake. You know, I thought about David and his, some of his men who, uh, who were the only ones was besides the Levites who <laughs> he went in yeah. at a time of need yeah. and uh, partook of the showbread. Yes. They were the only ones who ever did that that, that I know is recorded in history. That's right. And, That's right. Um, you know, I'm glad that uh, that... that uh, has been dealt with. Amen. That uh, that it's not restricted to a certain group of people, but Jesus has opened the door. Yes, he, he has. The veil being rent from the top to the bottom. Hallelujah. He's opened the door where we can all come and dine. We can sit down as Mephibosheth did That's right. continually. Amen. And I love that story, brother. Yeah. As, as he did continue, we can come and dine at the king's table. Amen. Praise the Lord. I, there, there is so much. We're, we're just about out of time. But there's so much yeah. uh, that can be read into this. Uh, uh, Brother Ellis, uh, you remember uh, even the word Bethlehem. Oh, yeah. His house of bread. House of bread. Yeah. And, and, and there is no coincidence uh, in, in God's word. <laughs> 
Um, but I, I, think, I think as we uh, maybe work our way toward an invitation, uh, Brother Ellis, uh, the, the, the priests, when, when they would change the bread out on the Sabbath, uh, it was a requirement of God that they had to eat that bread. That's right. They, they, they didn't take that bread and, 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 and throw it away and do away with it. Uh, the bread had to be consumed. And uh, that, so, so it is with a person uh, deciding uh, uh, maybe uh, to, to, uh, to come to Christ. Uh, as I was thinking about that, uh, my mind went to a verse of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, in chapter 4, verse 2, it says, For unto us was, was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith uh, of them that heard it. And the point being is you can know all about the table of showbread. Uh, you can know all the Bible verses. You can, yeah. you can attend all of the Sunday school classes. Uh, you can have, have your name on a registry uh, at your particular uh, denomination, at your particular church. But if you, have, if you have not taken and actually by faith, and this is how we consume Christ. Yes. This is how we consume this bread, this, this sustenance. We consume him by faith. Everything that we receive from God. Everything that we receive from God, Christ is the source. Christ is that bread. Christ is the one. Mm -hmm. But we have to, Brother Ellis, we have to take that by faith. And uh, it, it holds true whether it's for um, salvation. Yes. Uh, we take this bread by faith. Uh, or whether it be uh, in our daily walk, in our daily life. Even if you are a Christian, we, we need to get this. And, and not implying at all that, that we get saved over and over again. That's, that's not what, I, what I'm trying to get at. It's just the fact that, we're, that as Mephibosheth, we are to feed at this table continually. In other words... In other words, there's, there's a lot of folks, there's a lot of folks that's went to the table one time. Yeah. They went to the table one time and forgot about it. And trying to, and trying to navigate through life, uh, maybe trying to deal with uh, something that's wrong in their life, something that's wrong in a relationship. Um, Brother Ellis, we, we have got to take this Bible and what God has given us as truth and take it into our hearts by faith. Take it in and apply it to our lives. Um, if, you don't, uh, um, if you don't take a bite of the biscuit, it's not going to do you any good. Uh, you can look at it and hold it and smell it, but you've got to take it into your body. You've got to take it in. And we take Christ and his finished work, his perfect work, we take it in by yes, faith. That's it. Yeah, and that's that God doesn't have another way. Um, it's by faith in Christ and in him crucified. What he has done and what he alone has done that's going to change or exchange. I, I like to think of it more as an exchange life now because when you come to Christ, you forfeit your life. Yes. Uh, really, we need to understand that when we come to Him, we die. We die with Him. We participate in that death that He died. We're identifying with His crucifixion, whereas we should have been crucified, which if we had, we could redeem nobody. But He was and could redeem everybody. Amen. And so in doing that, He, he, he took us with Him. And let me say this, and if you want me to go into the yes. invitation, let me just say this to you tonight, dear friend. If you're lost, you have another opportunity to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, to believe yes. Yes. that you get saved the moment you believe. You have Amen. to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not that he was, not just in his virgin birth, not just in his incarnation, in his perfect life, sinless life, but in his vicarious death, yes. in what he did 
there on that cross, shedding blood, His blood, God's blood. That blood was shed for you, and it was shed for me. Believing that He died for you, was buried, and rose again the third day. You say it's that simple? Absolutely. It is that simple. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and, him, and receive Him into your heart. You can do that right now. Let's pray. Yes. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. We come to you in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The precious name. Lord, we pray for that soul tonight yes, that may yes. be just listening and thinking about their relationship, whether or not they have the relationship. Lord, I pray that you will move upon that soul by the Holy Spirit and they will confess you as Lord and Savior of their life. And Lord Jesus, I thank you that when that is done, you promised us that, Lord, we would be yes. forgiven, that you would wash us in your blood and you would deliver us from our sins. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. That your blood washes all our sins away and that we are justified by faith, grace, and blood in your sight. Father, I pray for that <clears throat> soul tonight, my brother and my sister, yes. who may be struggling. Help them to realize, Father, that we can continually go back and again and again receive yes, Lord. from you. Jesus, we thank you that you are the source and the cross is the means. And by what you've done there, that continual eternal work that you have done, you're not on the cross anymore. Amen. You're on the throne. Amen. But the, the after effects, the blessings come because of what you've done. Lord Jesus, we love you. Yes. Touch that, strengthen yes. that soul tonight yes. who may be discouraged, yes. who may be depressed. I yes. pray that you would shine light into their heart, yes. into their soul, and lift them up in the name of Jesus. Thank you for uh, this program tonight, and thank you, Lord, for our pastor yes. here. Thank and thank you. you for these who help us in the background. Lord Jesus, we love you, and we thank you for what you have done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, please tell your friends about it, and uh, we'll continue on uh, into the most holy place next week uh, with the help of the Lord. Uh, we love you and appreciate you. God bless you. See you next week. Bye-bye. Amen. Amen.